Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Today's uh, class is Royalty and Romance, Part 3. It's dedicated to Nishmat, the matron of our synagogue, Mrs. Lily Safra, Lava Shalom, Leah Badov, HaKohen, Vehana, Lava Shalom. Please make all the brachot li'iloi nishmata. Um, okay, so we are in the middle of uh, this series, um, and we're talking about the Davidic line and uh, why these particular individuals, these stories that we read about in Tanakh itself, lead to what we talk about as far as Mashiach itself. And we saw that the first story we brought up was David with uh, Yehuda and Tamar. Interesting story about um, the, uh, one of the, the, the heads, the prince, the Nasi, the tribe of Yehuda, was also the, 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 the king ultimately of, uh, the, of the Jewish people. And he had this interesting uh, interaction with um, his, uh, his uh, daughter-in-law that he ultimately had a child with. Um, and we know that the story ended with her revealing, you know, without revealing, without saying his name, that whoever this staff and cloak, you know, and signet ring, whoever belong, whoever these items belong to, this is the father of the child. Right? And this act of tzni'ut, this act of modesty, is what saves her life, because Yehuda was put into an interesting uh, situation where he got to choose, right? Now, she was lucky that he chose correctly. Now Yehuda's greatness doesn't come from the fact that he sinned, that he made a mistake. This is not the way a man interacts with a family member. He clearly made a mistake. The, the, the redemption of Yehuda came from the admission of his mistake. Right? His redemption came from the fact that he could have said, oh, that's not me, send her into the fires. Burn her, get rid of her. But the Yehuda as a character is redeemed when he takes full responsibility for what happens. Okay, takes responsibility, protects her. He, you know, he says he was not with her anymore. Okay, but takes responsibility and raises the kids as his own. That is malchut. That is the first stages of, I believe, malchut of kingship. The kingship itself resides in this process of taking ownership and responsibility. So we fast forward to, uh, you know, four or five hundred years later to the story of, no, it's less than that. It's about almost 250 years later. No, more, about 400, 400 years later, the story of Ruth and Boaz. Okay, we all are familiar with the story. It's uh, Megillah that we read uh, over Shavuot, right? Um, and it's a story of a, 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 a girl named Ruth who is a, uh, a convert and, uh, you know, we... Sukim are very short. It's not a very long Megillah. It's, there's four Prakim, there's four chapters in all of Sefer Rut. There's a total uh, 20, maybe 100 verses in total for the whole entire thing. Not a lot, considering that's a, it's a massively important text because it leads us to the birth of Yishai, which is uh, David's father, King David's father, the birth line of the Messianic line. And here we see a similar story, and we're going to go through it together. We're going we're to go through the story again together, but just a very quick overview an outline, yeah. Yeah, of course, we're going to see that in a minute. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, we see that Elimelech, right, who is uh, Ruth's husband, no, sorry, Naomi's husband, was a descendant of Yehuda, direct descendant. His grandfather was Nachshon ben Aminadav. Anyone remember who Nachshon ben Aminadav was? So Nachshon ben, Amin ben Aminadav was the prince of Yehuda, appointed by Moses. Anyone know what Nachshon's sister's name was? Nachshon's sister, his name was Avigail. And who did she marry? She married Aaron Akoin. Okay. Uh, so you have you have a uh, you have a uh, you you have Nachshon who is made famous when the Jewish people were, uh, were, were standing there as they were leaving out of Egypt, and they're standing at the, uh, at the Red Sea, and the sea wasn't splitting, and the Egyptians were coming with their armies, ready to go ahead and pounce on the Jewish people, people start crying. Nachshon jumps into the water, and he keeps walking and walking and walking and walking, and he keeps walking until the waters cover his mouth and nose. And it's at that moment, the Midrashim tell us, and in the merit of Nachshon jumping in first, okay, the water split for him in that sacrifice. As a matter of fact, one second, in the army, there's something called a Nachshoni, right? You know what a Nachshoni is? 
Anachshoni is where, like when, uh, when Ariel Sharon jumped into his tanks in 1967 and drove them all the way into Egypt. Right? Like he literally like, broke forward, like broke out. Like that idea of like breaking out into uh, of a very strong military position is still today. It's called the Nachshoni, based on this Midrash of Nachshon ben Aminadab jumping into the waters first. Okay, that's who uh, Elimelech is, and that's the connection to Yehuda. Nachshon's, uh, Nachshon, we'll see it in a minute, it'll be clear, we'll see it inside. But Elimelech, who is married to Naomi, whose sons end up dying and uh, ends up, one of the men's up marrying Ruth. So her, her father-in-law is Elimelech, who's a descendant of Nachshon, who's a descendant of Yehuda, and that's how the whole entire family uh, tree comes together. We'll see it all connected. But now these traits of, um, of breaking forward and you know, jumping in is a very Davidic trait. Right? And I want you to think of the following. We'll see this in a moment. Like, we're going to see this text together again. And we know that, that there's this concept of Yibum. We spoke about it a little bit last week. Remember, Yibum is a leveret marriage. Yeah. It was a man who is married to a woman and they have no children. The man dies. The closest blood relative has a mitzvah, has a commandment to marry that woman, right? With her permission, obviously. If she's not interested, then it doesn't work. Um, and we see that over here also. We see again with Yehuda and Tamar. You, uh, Tamar was married to Yehuda's children. They both died. We know that the next bro- brother should have married. Yeah. Two of them died. And Shelite, he didn't want him to marry him. So Yehuda ends up in now. Over here, you have the same story again. Right? right? Another story. That what is the relationship between Yibum and Mashiach? You see it happening hundreds of years earlier with Tamar and Yehuda. And you see now again that Ruth has no children. She is a Gioret. Okay. What's that? And uh, no, Tamar and Yehuda are not converts, right? Um, but over here, Ruth become, is a convert. She's a Moab, Moabite convert. Anyone know where Moab is today? Anyone ever seen the mountains of Moab? Uh, you've all seen them before. You know how I know? Because if you've been to the Dead Sea, when you're looking at the mountains across the Dead Sea, that, those mountains are those bluish hue mountains. That's Moab. <laughs> so you've seen those mountains, you know those plains, they're familiar to you, and maybe if you've gone to Jordan, you've got even up close and personal, but certainly if, even if you haven't gone to J- Jordan and you were at the Dead Sea, and you... Why you call it Moab? Me'av. Right, we'll, go, we'll do that later. I'm going to go, I'm gonna go backwards. So M- Moab, Moab, the Mo- she's a Moabite. The Moabite, the words Moab comes from the words Me'av, from my father. And that name comes from Lot. Lot when after when after the Dead Sea was destroyed, that area when the, when the five cities of, uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, we know that Lot ended up. His daughters believe they were there's no one left around, and she and the daughters in the beginning, their father drunk and have children from him. Okay, we're going to go through that also and see why that relationship is also somehow tethered to this whole entire story. But I wanted to first go through the Jewish families, you know, of uh, this, this interesting straight line from the fathers before we get to the mothers. We'll do that next week, God willing. We'll see who root comes from those. She's a descendant of Lot, who's a descendant of Abraham. And we have to understand why Lot was involved in all this and what was, why this is this way. Well, it's fascinating. So many interconnected uh, pieces over here, beautiful pieces of the puzzle that hopefully will give us a, a bigger, clearer picture as to uh, what actually transpired. So uh, one other thing I want you to be thinking of. So number one is what does Yibum, what does Yibum have to do with the story, the stories, and how is it related to Mashiach, right? Why, why does the Messianic line have to come from this very strange, you know, passionate, in- sexual, immoral relationship, what seems to be sexually immoral, questionable relationships? And what is Yibum, why is Yibum at the center of all these stories? Strange, right? And I, I, I'm hoping that by answering this question, you'll appreciate a little bit of the nuance, the depth, um, and maybe even the, uh, the raciness of our faith, right? Because these are not concepts of sanctity that you'll find in other religions. Certainly, uh, Christians believe that intimacy and sexuality is sin. It's part of original sin. Right? and that any kind of intimacy should be ideally prohibited. The early Christians were not allowed to marry. Okay? You had to be celibate. Real holiness was to be married to God and to no one else. And then when they realized that their numbers were dwindling and that Christianity was going to have no future without kids, they ended up changing the laws. That, well, you could, get, you could be intimate as long as you're married, 
but really you, you has to have, that sanctification has to come through the church, and even that is considered to be a somewhat of an abomination, but we per- permit it in order for the sake of uh, you know, a, a, a pedigree and a dynasty that will be able to preserve our faith. Um, but they don't see it whole. Ideal person is the preacher, is the nun, is the father, someone who completely divests himself from all materialism, from all gashmiut, from all physical things, that is the ideal state. Judaism rejects that concept. Judaism accepts the concept of living a life of material, but we use the material to elevate it into something spiritual. Right? Like we spoke about last week, the idea of netilat yadaim. We wash our hands, we make the blessing on the raising of the hands because we want to remind ourselves, we want to raise this food into something bigger, better. We don't want this to be a thing of eating. Everything I use my hands for is to take from the physical world, but I want this moment to break away from that act of taking with my hands and I want to elevate it into something more. Al netilat yadaim. We make the brachais to raise your hands, actually. That's where it comes from, okay? Fine. Having said that, Megillah begins as follows. Okay, this is the time of the judges. Now, this is important. This is the time where the judges rules. Now, this particular time period in the Jewish history is fascinating because there was no king. And you just had courts. So who instilled the law? Who was who were where were the policemen? And the answer is there was no police. This was a self-governing society. That's right. Each person did what was straight, and he was the one. Everyone did their own thing. But there had to be courts because Judaism requires that we set up courts. Okay, so this is a very fascinating period. This is something that some progressive would like today. No police, defund the police, and allow us to do our own thing. Now, this could only work in a society that has a uh, core values. There's a sheet over there. Uh, that has core values that we're all aligned with. What happens to a society where we don't share core values? What happens to a society where all of us have a different set of moral principles? And the answer is anarchy. It doesn't work. The, the uh, founding fa- fathers of this country who understood there has to be a separation of church and state, right? Because when you, uh, when you add a church and state together, you have people making passionate mistakes that end up creating horrible consequences for the future. I'll explain. Um, I love Israel. And um, I love living in Israel, but I have a hard time with Israel because when you mix Judaism and politics together, it brings out the worst parts of our people, right? And so uh, this is a true story that happened to me many years ago. This happened in, 20, 2000, in the year 2000, right? 22 years ago. I was a studying in Kolel, and um, I was, wasn't feeling well. I stayed home. And at around... Uh, uh, Three o'clock in the afternoon, I get a knock on my door, and I see it's one of the guys from my from my kollel. I'm like, "What are you doing here? You should be in yeshiva." He's like, "Oh, he's like, you know, the rabbi told us to stop learning today. We have to go and knock on people's doors and tell them to go vote. It's important that everyone goes vote today, it's like a public service announcement. They stop the yeshivat so that people can go out and vote, and these are the people you need to vote for, right?" So I'm like, "I don't like this. Like, you're taking off from your learning because it's more important to tell people who to vote for. Like, how does that? How does that even? How do you? How do you allow that even?" and you're voting for a particular type, you're telling me who to vote for, a particular type of party. Like when that becomes, when we stop limud, at the core of Judaism is this concept of learning Torah. We believe that is everything, right? Talmud Torah, Keneged, Kulam, right? It's equal to, equal to everything. We're going to stop this so that people can go out and tell people who to vote. Hora, Sha'a, it's a circumstance that requires us to go out. This is an abomination, as far as I'm concerned. And these things happen because, oh, well, if we don't get our guy in, we're going to lose grants and money and so on and so forth. This is a very warped way of thinking. So I think this is actually a dangerous way of thinking. This is the one thing that scares me the most about Israel and the politics. There should not be a, any kind of connection between the politics and religion. It should be separate. The founding forefathers of this country understood that separation was important. What's happening now, I'm not sure if you're following the YU law case, Right, where the uh, city is actually suing a Yeshiva University to uh, ensure that gay people have equal rights on their campus. Okay? Now this is a massive breach of, uh, of, uh, of law because we know there's a separation of church and state and if, a church, if the state could come along and say, well, we're going to tell you how your church needs to act, if they lose this case, it's still going on court right now, this will impact every religious institution 
in New York. Every yeshiva, every church, every, every mosque, they could come in and say, well, we're going to defund you, we're going to lose all your status, because if you don't go ahead and accept these people and, you know, with these particular status, if you don't create inclusivity, if it's not in your doctrine, we're going to cut you. Now, this is fascinating because there's actually a very similar case that took place about 200 years ago in, uh, in Vilna, right, in Lithuania. There was a yeshiva there, okay, known as Velazhin. Velazhin yeshiva was one of the most preeminent yeshivot that was around. The Vilna Gaon student, Rukhaim of Velazhin, started it based on this Litvish uh, you know, type of thinking. And the Russian government was already meddling in the education, and they came down to the yeshiva and they said, listen, you know what, in order for you to keep your yeshiva open, we need to keep the uh, certain standards of education, you need to start introducing secular studies in your, sc- in your school. And if you don't, I'm going to shut you down. So the Russian yeshiva had to make a choice. What do I do? What would you do? Okay, you have a choice now. Okay, you're going to take a tradition that's been going on for 1,800 years, building a yeshivot, you have full control of the education, keep it your way, or create this new adulterated, uh, you know, uh, hybrid of an education so you could placate the local uh, politicians in town. What do you think he did? He shut down the yeshiva. He's like, I'd rather not create this hybridization of secular studies and uh, religious studies. I'd rather not do it at all. They closed the yeshiva down because of this. So what YU does, YU itself was a fascinating experiment because is, is it a yeshiva or is it a university, right? And that's what they're really fighting right now. If they're a religious institution, then the, the, the city can't say anything to them. They'll do whatever religious things they're permitted to do. But if it's a university and it falls in the category of a university, then the city has a right to go ahead and tell the yeshiva what rules need to be in place for them to receive the funding that they receive. Now. We'll see this, I think, in the story as well. I'm jumping around a little bit, but I just want to say this because I want to move through the text very quickly. This idea of holiness in Judaism is fascinating. There was this concept we see during the times of the Greeks, uh, where the Greeks uh, ruled over Israel. They realized that the only way to get Jews to be defeated is through spiritual means. We see this in this last week's parasha as well. Bilam realizes that they're not going to, he can't curse the Jewish people. But everyone knows that God, God hates sexual immorality. So what do we do? We're going to create a vote Zarah, Baal Pa'or. Okay, we're going to get people to worship this, these gods. How are we going to do it? If you worship this God, you get a free prostitute, no problem, free of charge, on us. We'll take care of that for you. But if we get these people to sin, that will become the destruction of the Jewish people. Now, sexual immorality, okay, is an important conversation to have. Well, how does a guy who's married get to a place where he's willing to go ahead and do something like this? Now, I'm gonna argue, okay, there are some horrible, horrible human beings out there, horrible men who are just snakes and are disgusting human beings. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the guys who are married but are tempted. Temptation often comes from a place of weakness in a relationship. Okay, this is not someone's fault, it's just, that's just the nature of human beings. But I have a hard time believing that a man would succumb to sexual immorality if he's in a relationship that is healthy. And therefore, at the core of what makes a society holy is a society of couples who are in happy, healthy relationships. Okay, that is what we're aiming for. There's a breakdown of those relationships. There's a breakdown of the sanctity, breakdown of the sanctity, breakdown of the relationship between man and God, comes destruction, okay? The Greeks understood that the way we can't defeat, can't defeat the, uh, the, the Jews. This, this Judaism is too much of a spiritual you know, power. I, we can't, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna institute this new rule called prima nocte. Okay, prima nocte was the rule that you had a general who oversaw a particular town. If there was going to be a wedding in that town, the bride had to sleep with the general before she slept with the bride. This was the practice. This happened in uh, Israel. Now, what? The, the Greek general. This was in Israel. In Israel. When the, during the times of Hanukkah. This is part of what led to the Maccabean revolt. Okay? You know, I was in... Uh, I was on this tour uh, a few weeks ago of, um, in one of the new uh, sections of the uh, Kotel tunnels. 
And the lady, this is a nice Israeli tour guide, was talking about how the Romans and the Greeks, they weren't so bad. It's just the Jews caused the trouble. The Jews caused the trouble. I'm like, are you serious? Like, I couldn't believe she said that. She said this to my group, and I, and I started arguing with her, and the group didn't want me to, like, I took up too much time. So, like, oh, you're taking this letter. But, like, I was so frustrated. I'm like, how could you say that, that, that that's what happened? Like, they went out. There was no religious, religion tolerance. They were super cruel. They had crazy taxes. It wasn't that the, that the Jews were just stop fighting for the sake of fighting, right? There was something wrong there. Now, the Greeks went out of their way to try to obliterate Judaism. Now, remember, they were Hellenists, which means they believed that you have to take a little bit of truth from every single religion. But in order to destroy spirituality of the Jewish people, they got rid of the laws of Tata Mishpacha, no mikvah going, no Brit Milah, no Shabbat, got rid of all that stuff. No, no Chodesh Zelechem, no, no new moon blessings. Anything that had to do with the sanctity of a family, they destroyed. And they went so far as to create this thing called Prima Nacte, where if there was going to be a wedding in Israel, okay, the bride had to sleep with the general before the wedding. Now, why do they do this? They understood that if, a, if this general rapes this bride, that he leaves a piece of his vulgarity inside of her, and that's enough to taint her spiritually forever. That the way in which you destroy the Jewish people is literally from the inside. This approach is novel. Okay? This is, but it comes from the same thing like we saw with Bilam and Balak, the same idea. We're talking about... Um, 20, 2,200 years ago. It happened later in Europe also, but not with the same. It happened many places in history. Right, but this is, this, is, this is like the clearest first time you see it because it wasn't just... We're talking about a society that, that, that dubbed itself being religiously tolerant. The Greeks were open to... They were polytheists. Every religion is true. So why were they so anti-Judaism? They saw Judaism as a threat to their culture because people were not assimilating. Too much sanctity, too many boundaries, too much kedusha. They hated that. These people are not falling in line with our ideas of assimilation. We need to break them. Okay? So we talk about sanctity in Judaism. We're talking about, talking about family. We're talking about tradition. We're talking about generations. We're talking about passing down a set of beliefs, a set of, you know, uh, of spiritual uh, uh, potential for future generations. And we see how outside the Goyim were trying to break it. And here we're seeing, reading stories about the inside, how it was already broken. Right? We all, everyone, everyone's uncomfortable <coughs> with the idea of, <coughs> of, of, of sexual immorality. Right? But here you have a story again of more of this. And I'm just trying to add fuel to the fire. Why do we find these concepts buried deep into King David's family? Okay. Any questions before we move on? Okay, great. So let's go. So it's, this is the time during the Shvatim, right? These are the, t- the times of the Shvatim. I'm in source number one. That is uh, the uh, we're reading uh, Sefer Rut, chapter one, and the first four Pesukim. Okay, so a, uh, there's a famine that breaks out into the land. There's someone from the native tribe of, uh, of Judah with his wife, two sons. They went to the countries of Moab. They crossed over through the Dead Sea. They went over to those mountains, and now they're in Moab. Jordan, Kurt Jordan. The man's name was Eli Melech, his wife's name was Naomi, and his two sons were Machlon and Kilion. Okay? Um, they were uh, 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 um, Ephrotim mi Bet Lechem Yehuda. Okay? They were Ephrotites of Bet Lechem in Yehuda. They came to the country of Moab and they remained there. Eli Melech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with their two sons, and they married Moabite women. One named Orpah, the other named Ruth, and they lived there for about 10 years. Now, can you imagine the story? Here you have a guy who was very wealthy. He was a very learned Jew from a very prominent family. And he decides to move out of Borough Park and to go to the Hamptons, right? You know, he moves out of a, his very religious community, his very religious Jewish community, and now he's going to a very secular community. Now, why does he go? So there's a famine, so he's going to run away from the famine. But so if you're rich and you have money, right? So that's exactly what Rashi tells us. Look at the bottom. Okay, look at Rashi first. We're going to use Rashi a lot today. Okay, Rashi says like this. Now it came to pass in the days of the judgment. Before King Shaul reigned, when generations were governed by judges, and this was the days of Ibzan, right? Okay, this is a time of Ibzan is Boaz. What does the name Boaz mean? Anyone know? Boaz. Very good. Boaz, may the strength come. 
right? May that power come. He's like, that's this, Boaz represents power, okay? And not just a physical strength. We're talking about an intellectual strength, a spiritual strength. That's who Boaz was, okay? The man, and a man went. He was very wealthy and a leader of a generation. He left the land of Israel for regions outside the land because of stinginess. Too many people came knocking on his door. I was overwhelmed by beggars coming to his house. Didn't like it. So he begrudged the poor who came to press him, therefore he was punished. And this is why he dies. He dies because to be from the line of Judah means taking responsibility. That's what it means to be a melech. To be a prince means to take responsibility. You need to take ownership of the situation, not run away from it. You're in a situation where it's trying, it's difficult. Our natural inclination is to run away. Who wouldn't want to, I don't want to deal with this. Forget about poverty. Think about it in our own lives for a minute. How many times do we find ourselves struggling with something and our natural inclination is flight? I want to run away from it. I don't want to deal with it. This is a mistake. The circumstances that we find ourselves in are there to challenge us so that we can grow. A melech is supposed to understand that better than anyone else. And the melech fails his test. The test should have been something that allowed him to grow into something more Instead, he dies a short, he has a short life, he dies. Naomi's husband, three. Why is it stated? Why does Pasuk say Naomi's husband? We know it's her husband. From here, Achachamim derived, a man does not ex- die except concerning his wife. What does that mean? Naomi's husband. That is to say that because he was her husband and ruled over her and she was subordinate to him, therefore the divine standard of justice struck him and not her. Because her relationship was so pristine with her husband and she did everything that she was supposed to do, even though he made the mistake, he was punished, not her. Why wasn't she punished? She went along with it, right? But she was doing exactly what she was supposed to do. She was a wife who was there in support of her husband. She had no choice, right? She was doing exactly what a great woman would do. She didn't sin. Correct. She could have, but if you're, if, you're, if you're married and your husband decides that he wants to go to a new place, you have a choice to make, right? Do you, do you, do you divorce him or do you go with him? Do you divorce him or do you go with him? Was he, what, did, did it, from her perspective, was he doing something wrong? She had, like, I guess, I guess it, like he was being a little stingy, but would you divorce your husband because of stinginess? Do you know what I'm saying? Like we're talking about... Yeah. Correct. He, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard situation. I mean, like, you make it practical for yourself. Okay, you're married and your husband decides he wants to move jobs, so he wants to go someplace else. He just doesn't want to live in the community he's in right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just like a weird... She, she's, she's there to be a supportive wife. That's her role. Now, when we look at Naomi, are we thinking of a, of a, of a weak woman? We're talking about a, a very bright, intelligent, who's very clear, strong person. We're not talking about a weak woman. But in, in, having said that, she still took on this role of supporting. I, and I'll give you a, a better example. You know, like I'm, I know people sometimes in a husband-wife relationship, a wife is stronger spiritually than her husband, right? So now she has a choice to make. How hard does she push, right? So you could push to a point, and there's a breaking point, right? It's very possible that Elimelech was not on the same level as Naomi, and that she understood his spiritual abilities and could not push him. And she was therefore being, playing the role of supportive wife, hoping that he would come to the senses and move back. That's one narrative. I don't know if that's true. I have no midrashim, but like I suspect that she was greater than him spiritually, which is why she's around, and the story is really about her and not him, even though he is the line. He's the line that gets us to, to Judah and to Mashiach, ultimately, not her. But, but she's the, 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 main, the main character of the story. And, and this is the same concept that we spoke about you know, uh, two weeks ago, the idea of tzni'ut is about not being not noticed. It's about understanding how to play your role, right? So Naomi is playing her role. That's strength. That's real femininity. She knows when to be absent and be behind the scenes, and she knows when to be present. We see this most clearly by, with, you know, with who? With Abraham and Sarah. I have a suspicion 
that most of the time when we read the Torah, we're hearing about Avraham and his interactions with people around him, it's really all coming from Sarah. Shema B'kola, right? Whatever God says to Abraham, whatever Sarah says, you listen to her. So I have a feeling that Sarah, who is, her name was, uh, her name was Yiske, right, before Sarah. Yiske, Chachamim, tell us, means she was a gazer. She, she was a, she, Yiska, she was a viewer, she was a seer. She had Nevu'ah that was greater than Abraham. But yet, there's very little mention of her. That's only Abraham. She, un, she uses Abraham as the kli, as the vessel, that gives her expression in the story. That's a very high level of femininity. Again, I don't... So I think, I, I, really, I said this, I think we've lost, we don't understand what femininity is anymore. But why do you hear more stories about Sarah? I think that, I, 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 it's because most people, uh, unfortunately, just learn on a very superficial level. But like if you go through Midrashim, where uh, when you go through the story of Avram and Sarah, like she's all over the place. She was beautiful. I, she was a gingy, red hair, blue eyes. She was beautiful. She was intelligent, you know. <laughs> She was a, uh, this, uh, this uh, stunning powerhouse of a person. The Gemara says there's no one that had the beauty of Sarah. Sarah was one of the most beautiful women that ever lived. So, it's a midrash. It's one of the, uh, it's actually an obscure midrash that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's not, you can't find it in any other midrashim. There's a set of Dead Sea Scrolls of Midrashim that were never printed. I have a professor, Professor uh, Lehman, who uh, has the largest ancient archive of ancient scrolls in the world. And um, I took classes with him when I was a student at Brooklyn College. I was a Judaic studies major with a bio major and a psychology major. Judaic studies was like a hobby. And uh, we, uh, we went through a lot of these ancient texts. And one of these things we found together was this whole midrash, this description of her. It's a 2,200-year-old two, midrash that talks about her. And he says very clearly that Esav, who we know has red hair and blue eyes, gets it from Sarah. By the way, who else has red hair and blue eyes? David Melech, also, it's coming from Sarah, right, right. So, uh, yeah, she was uh, she was a, she was this beautiful, beautiful lady, this power powerhouse of a woman. She you're right. She did. She did. So, so the two things. One is that listen, I, I would say to you that. On one hand, I could argue that, you know, like Rashi said, that she did what her husband said. On the other hand, you could also argue that she was punished. It wasn't, she was punished. That <laughs> she had to deal with a life without her husband and sons. She didn't go back. Why did her sons have to die? Her father, her husband died first. She stayed. She definitely made a mistake here. She was, she was a widow. She was alone. She didn't get remarried. There's no happy ending for her. She dies alone. No sons. She does. She realized after her sons died and her husband died, like, oh my God, this is, this is, this is a mistake. This is clearly a punishment. It's obvious now. I got to get out of here. Yeah, no, it's a, horrible, it's a horrible story. This is not a great story. This is a horrible story, but we read it because it's important for us to remember, right? It's part because, because of the redemptive nature of it, yes. So both of her sons die, okay? They both died. But they married these, these goyim, Okay. So look at the next, the next set of the next set of pesukim. What's that? Look, look, look. N- look let, let's just look at look at the next uh, next source. That's number three. Tinaset kola number three. They broke into weeping again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law farewell. Right? They both died. Every the both, both sons dies, and she says, "You see, your sister-in-law has returned to her pe- people and her gods. Go follow your sister-in-law." This at this point, Naomi is telling us, "I don't want to go through all of the verses because it's forever." So I'm just kind of skip around a little bit just to get to the main the main, part, main parts. Naomi at this point is trying to convince her daughter-in-law, "Listen, I have no sons. Go ahead. Your sister is returning back to her family. Ruth, you go as well. Turn the page, right?" Okay, uh, turn back and, and not, don't follow me. For where, she says, no, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. That's the famous basuk. Right? Okay, that's where I'm going to go. Your people are my people and so on and so forth. Where you die, I will die. Where you're going to be buried, that's where I'm going to be. Okay? When Naomi saw how determined Ruth was, she said, she said to her, okay, you know what? I'm not going to argue with you anymore. The two of them went on until they reached Bethlehem. So they left Moab. They come to Bethlehem. At this point, she has, who did she, what did she come back with? This beautiful woman, Naomi, who came from a very wealthy family, very prestigious family, had two sons, beautiful boys. Now she's coming back home after 10 years of being away. 
she has no husband, no sons, and she's coming with this goy. No money. This, this, this non-Jewish Moabite convert, right? This is, this is the, how embarrassing is this? Can you imagine, God forbid, like the, the shame? But she's going back to her people and she realizes that I need to go back. She could have stayed. She goes, I'm just going to die. No, I don't want anyone to know. I'm going to hide. I'm going to... But that's how she does. She goes back and she faces the music. Right? She goes back and she faces the shame. <coughs> okay, when they arrive in, in, in Bethlehem, the whole city buzzed with excitement over them. And the women said, can this be Naomi? Can you imagine? Like this, the Pasuk is telling us what Lashon Hara people were speaking about at the time. Naomi. She says, don't call me Naomi. Right? Call me Mara. Why is Aleph What? You're reading it. Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. Right? Because God has made my lot very bitter. I went away full, and the God brought me back empty. How can you call me Naomi when the God has dealt harshly with me, when Shakai has brought misfortune upon me? Therefore, Naomi returned from the country of Moab, and she returned with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the Moabite. They arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay, we know the barley harvest is the time of what holiday? Between around Pesach and Shavuot, right? And that's why we read this story during that time, same time period, so we're connected to it. Okay, look at, let's look at Rashi number 16. Okay, Rashi on, 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 uh, on uh, Pasuk uh, Tet Zayin. So it says, wherever you go, I go. I will go, right? From here, Chachamim derived that a, pro- a prospective proselyte, right, a convert, who comes to convert, is told some of the, of, of the punishments for violating commandments. So that if she decides to renege, he can renege. For out of Ruth's words, you learn that Naomi said to her, we may not go out of the boundary of 2,000 uh, uh, cubits, amot, on all sides, on Shabbat. She said to her, wherever you go, I will go. We are prohibited to follow a female, to be seduced with a male who is not her husband. She said, wherever you go, wherever you lodge, wherever you sleep, I will sleep. Our people are separated from other people, six hundred commandments. Your people are my people. So these weren't just stam, uh, little, you know, uh, nice uh, platitudes that uh, Ruth was giving to Naomi, but these were, this was Naomi literally three times trying to push this girl, this girl who was a goya away. And this is the source for it, right here. Okay, this is the source. You have to push away a convert a few, three times before you accept them. Okay, she started telling about some of the laws. Are you sure you want to do this? She says, yes, your God is my God. Four types of death penalties delegated to the the Betin in court. Right, wherever you die, I will die. The burial plots were delegated to the Betin to bury the executed. One who was stoned, one who was burned, and one who is uh, decapitated or those that strangled. She replied, I will be wherever you go, I will go. Like she was with her 100% of the time, no matter what. Now you know that there's a famous midrash that says that when a Jewish person dies, what's the first question they ask them? What's your name? What? What's your name? And what's the second question? <laughs> the first question is not what's your name, no. <laughs> yes, were you honest in business? Is the first question they ask a Jew when they die. Okay. Were you honest in business? That's the first question. That's a whole other she war we could do another time. Yeah, how do we Okay, that's another shear, not another, another time. But now, the question the Midrash, people don't know. The next thing the, the Midrash says, what's the first thing they ask a convert when they died? What's the first question they ask a convert when they die? Did your father live in Nope. No. What took you so long? Oh. Is that interesting? What took you so long to convert? Why, why did... What's that? That's not true. We do want converts. No, we're not anti-converts. We just want people to be sincere. No, no, that's, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. It's not a joke. I mean, I'm telling you what the Midrash says. I'm not telling you, you know, I'm not telling you what I think it is, but Midrash, how do we know that if you were, you know, honest in your business, where does that come from? Also, it's Midrashim. These are the things that, these are part of our, you know, of our, of our legends. Okay, but the idea... No, so there's a reason why business, I don't want to get into that, I, I, but just be, be mindful that those concepts exist. And the idea with a convert is that a convert is asked about what took them so long to get to this particular place of clarity to move forward. Now, we know that a convert is holier than a Jew. Okay, we know this from a very interesting place. When the concept, when we are saying Shemona Esrei in the repetition, we say Kedusha, 
We say Kadosh, 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 Hashem. Who says those words, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh? Where do those words come from? It comes from the Malachim. Right? When, a me, when, a, when an angel wants to approach God, he has to take three steps. Kadosh, 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 and then he can say God's name. When a Jew wants to, to approach God, what does he have to say? Baruch Ata Hashem. Two steps before he gets to God. Right? Who was the first person to say Baruch Hashem? Anyone know? Yeah, who said that? No, earlier, before that, before, no, no, like after Yaakov. What's that? Yeah, that's right. It was Yitro. Yitro said, the first person to say Baruch Hashem. And we learned there, Chachamim teach us, that a, not a convert, right, can take one step before he gets to God. A Jew needs two steps and an angel needs three steps. So we see from here that a convert is closer to God because there's less prep that he has to do to get to God. Prep, preparation, right? There's different stages. Baruch Ata Hashem for a Jew. Kadosh, 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 three. And then only two. Baruch Hashem, one step for a, a convert. So converts in Judaism are very holy, irrespective of whatever edict is somewhere in the building. Uh, you know, don't believe it. Uh, converts are special and holy. And, you know, every year for the last 10 years, I've, I've sponsored one or two uh, uh, converts that are going through the process. To become a sponsoring rabbi is a very tremendous amount of dedication and time. Uh, you're basically having these people come to your house minimally once a month because how could you go through a convert? How could you go through the conversion process if you've never spent a Shabbat with a family and so on and so forth? Um, so like I've, I've done this for over a decade and I've seen some of the most remarkable Jews come through a process of conversion, right? Or goyim who became Jews, yeah. No, not always. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. You, a lot of the times, what I found is that the um, the the interest begins to be is peaked because of a relationship. Like so, for example, I used to be the uh, the chaplain at Long Island University, and I would have like you know I had an office where people would come in, talk classes, whatever it was on campus. So there's one girl who came to my classes for like a whole semester. I forget her name right now. Um, and um, I started talking to her after the class, like, where are you from? You know, I thought she was, I knew she was, she looks Sephardic. I'm like, where are you from? So she's from, um, she's from Libya. I'm like, from Libya? Like, w- which, which community are you from? You know, and she's like, you know, she's like, you know, I'm not Jewish. I'm like, what do you mean you're not Jewish? She's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Muslim. I'm like, you're Muslim. So what are you doing in my classes? She's like, you know, many years ago online, I, was, I was, had a pen pal, he was Jewish, and I really liked him, and we'd have all these conversations about Judaism, and I would, uh, he would keep referencing this website called H.com, and I kept going there, and I kept reading all the articles, and I realized that, that Islam is false and Judaism is true. So I came to New York in the process of going through Geirut, and uh, I'm converting. She's like, you know, I'm like, what do your parents think? She's like, my parents wanted to disown me. She said, what I found out though, because my parents were, like, they said, you're going to do this, don't do it here, don't tell anyone, go away, leave the community because they're going to kill us over here, you know. I found out though before I left that my neighbor, you know, this neighboring family, the, the wife came to me and she was actually Jewish. She's a Jew and she converted to Islam. And she spoke about how beautiful Judaism and she encouraged me and so on and so forth to go off on my own path. So she comes to America, she's studying at uh, Long Island University. Okay, um, two years later, she goes through a gay root process and she goes through conversion and she ends up getting married and then she invites me to the wedding. So I'm at this wedding, okay, this, also a convert. Okay, the convert is a, uh, did I tell you the story already? No, but that's a great story. Convert, the convert is from Texas, okay, and he, he was, uh, so I started talking to him like, we're, tell me your story. He says, you know, we're, there's a, we're part of a small church in Texas and uh, there's like 250 families. We all came from like Mexico. We moved into to America and we were churchgoers. And the preacher that was in our church was, you know, giving us these amazing classes. And um, at some point after opening the church for five years, he comes down, he says, I have a confession to make. All of my teachings are from Torah and that I'm converting to become a Jew and I'm leaving the uh, church and you have a choice to make. You know, you could either well, get you a new pastor to teach you whatever you want to learn, or you could come with me. So, okay, 90% of, of the church converted. The church was converted into a synagogue. Okay, and this, this is in Texas. This happened about 15 years ago. You could find the story. What's that? Yeah, there are articles on it. Yeah, yeah, I could send you the article on this. 
okay? And this boy, his father was the leader of these South Americans that were involved in helping build this church and the biggest supporter of this preacher. Okay, so there were about 220 families that converted. They all became Jews, and the church now is a shul. And this guy went to Yeshiva, went to Orsamech, okay, went through conversion, and he found this Christian boy ended up marrying this Muslim girl, <laughs> and they moved, and, and they're both Jews now. Both Jews living in Israel. Living, living in Israel, made Aliyah. Made Aliyah, and they're living in Israel. Okay, beautiful, beautiful story, special, special people, but you know, each of them. Oh, 100%. There was a fascinating article in the New York Times, I could find it for you about 12 years ago, of a uh, New York Times reporter. She's from Central America, okay. Um, and uh, what's that? Oh, you know, you know what I'm talking about? I, I know a lot of crypto Jews who converted. So, so she. So if she, she was telling the story, I forget her name, what's her name? Denise? Karmahal. Karmahal? No, Kar, C-A-R-D-A-J-A-L. Kardahel. Kardahel. I can't hear you. I can't, hear, I can't read you. It's okay, you can leave it, it's fine. I just, I just, okay, whatever her name is, Kar, uh, Denise. And uh, so uh, she was, uh, she wrote this fascinating article about butterflies and memories, right? Remember that? So uh, she was, uh, she had this dream as a little girl to go out to, uh, to Spain. I forget which city. I think I, I may have been. Um, I don't remember where. I don't, I don't remember which city she wanted to go to. She had she had this dream of going to this particular city in Spain, and maybe it was Madrid. I think it was Madrid, and uh, she goes there and she has all these crazy memories, like she was there before, and she ends up doing research and she finds an archive that her family actually came from this particular town, in Madrid, and it turns out that they lived in a Jewish ghetto, and the only way you could come from that ghetto is if you were a Jew. So she comes back home, she starts speaking to her grandmother about it. She says, yeah, yeah, she's like, we're descendants of Jews. And like, you know, I like candles in the closet. And she's like, crypto Jew. And she never knew, but she had all these very powerfully profound, strong connections to Spain and a particular, and these, these Jewish parts of Spain. So she starts doing research and she finds out that there's, there's something called transgenerational uh, uh, memories. That, there, that, that a, you could pass down uh, memories from generation to generation. That, um, that just like butterflies, they did the study in, in London, where uh, in England, where they uh, studied these butterflies that you know were born on a particular bush, and then generations later, uh, three generations later, the, the same butterflies would come back and have their children on the same branch that their great grandparents were born on when they never met. How do they know where to go? So we know that uh, when you are, when each of us were uh, in utero in our mothers, okay, when we were in our mothers, right, um, we were also in our grandmothers, right, because. What ends up happening is that your grandmother, when she was carrying our mothers, right, and our mothers were in her utero, all those cells were there. And there's a residue that some of those cells end up staying with the child, right? Sometimes, um, if you're, oh, there's old ladies here, so when, have, you, have you ever felt like you knew something was happening to your kid? Yeah. Like, oh, I got this feeling. Like, I was, like, I remember, I was, uh, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, I was at a, I was, uh, had a, it was after a post-fast Sheva Brachot at my house, and I got to speak, and I, I didn't eat enough, and I passed, I was just, I fainted, right? Five minutes later, my mother calls my wife and says, what's wrong with my son? Mm -hmm. Right? How does she know? So on a, on a cellular level, I suspect, of course, there's a spiritual connection here, but if you need to have more tangible things, there's parts of me that's inside of her, right? And there's a connection. These, there's a communication over there. Something's happening on a level. And on some level, yibum, by the way, is the same concept, the same idea, where there's this spiritual connection between generations that are passed down from today and tomorrow, right? And yesterday and today. It's all interconnected. Anyway, that was a fascinating tangent. I apologize. Let's just, let's, just, uh, let's, let's get back to uh, business over here. Okay, that was all for entertainment. That's what we call edutainment. Okay, Ela Naomi, right, right. The Isha Ish Giburcha Mishpachat Ali Melch Shmo Boaz. And now Naomi had a uh, family member, right, on the husband's side, a man of substance, right. He was a ben, uh, he was a uh, he was a ben Torah. He was also a very wealthy person from the family of Ali Melch. His name was Boaz. Okay, and Boaz was there. Toma Ruth Hamoavia El Naomi. 
right, and root the Moabites said to Naomi, I'm going to go to the field and, and take some of their uh, you know, ears of grain and find someone to show me some kindness. Yes, go, she said. Okay, and off she went. And she came and gleaned the field behind the reapers. And as luck would have it, it was the piece of land belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, right, presently, right? Now, look at that pasuk over there, right? Vehine Boaz ba. And behold, Right? Boaz comes. And this means that he wasn't supposed to be there. Boaz, this is all God's hand orchestrating it. He's not supposed to be there. He comes from Bethlehem and he greets all the reapers. Right? 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 This is where, if you ever notice sometimes when a man goes up to the Torah, he says, before he says the Baruch, he says, Hashem Echem. The response is, Yivarech Hashem. It's from this, this greeting. When people would greet each other back then, you'd say, Hashem Echem. And their response back would be Yevrech Hashem. That's from this pasuk over here. Okay, Ve'yomer Boaz le'narav hanisav. Right, he says back. Boaz says back to uh, the people over there, to the servants. He, he's, he says, "Who's a girl? Who's this girl that's in uh, our garden?" Right, Ve'yomer Narav Movia. So why is he asking? Why does he notice the girl? Why does he notice the girl? She was different, but more than that, the midrash tells us the reason why he noticed her is because the guys didn't notice her. The, the reapers didn't notice her. He's noticing her because he's realizing that the reapers don't notice her. You have this very attractive girl who's not a drawing attention to her. She's very tznu'ah. There's something special about her. right? There's something unique about her. That here is this beautiful, vivacious young lady and none of the guys there are paying attention to her. Not paying attention. He notices it. There's something unique about this person. Who is she? So Rashi tells us the kinsmen are who? He was the son of Elimelech's brother. Who was Elimelech, the son of Solomon, the father of Boaz, and so forth? He was the son of Nachshon, son of Aminadav. That's the connection over here to Yehuda. The merit of the fathers not avail them, and they were left in the land to go abroad. Fine. For Tomar la Naomi. Okay, this is already, now we know that uh, what happens in the verses later is that uh, Naomi recognizes that Boaz has an interest. Boaz tells her, you can eat, take anything you want from my field. It's all yours. Don't worry about it. You're safe. And, uh, and there's this whole interaction going, yeah. But there's also that Boaz takes an interest in her because his wife died. Really That's also true. true. That's also true. That's also true. This is also true. His wife does die, but he's an old man. And I don't believe that he's interested. As a matter of fact, when the Midrash says that later on, where she comes to him in the middle of the night and stays there by his feet and uncovers the blanket by his, his feet, right? It's an interesting way to waking up a man. Okay, make sure he gets cold feet, right? <laughs> right. So uh, Midrash over there says that um, he asks her, are you a spirit or are you a woman? She says, I'm a woman. She says, are you married? Uh, and she says, no, I'm not married. She says, are you uh, Nida or not? She says, I'm not a Nida. So now it's very easy to interpret that he was interested in seeing if she was available and ready to get into action with, right? But Midrash says that's not what he was asking. He was asking specifically to come up with a reason not to be with her. He did not want her there. The opposite, the opposite is true. He was not interested. He was an old man. She was, depending on which Midrashim you look at, he was either 80 or 400. Okay, either way, he's an old man. She's got to be in her late 30s, early 40s. I thought it was because he didn't have somebody was married before him to bless somebody else's family. You're talking about the, the, uh, the Yibum? That's true also. But he was trying to figure out a way, yes, but he was trying to figure out a way of not being with her. This wasn't a uh, story of an old uh, man who was you know, alone and looking for companionship. That's not what's motivating him over here. Okay, his motivation is very different. Now, you have to be mindful. Again, it's very easy to humanize these people and make them like any other man. Now, you have to understand, not all men are like the men of today. For example, the Vilna Gaon, okay, who lived 270 years ago, right before he would write a halakha, he would fast for 30 days. Okay, we're talking about people who operated on a different wavelength. Okay, people who were deeply involved in spiritual... The altar of Navardic locked himself in a room for 18 months because he wanted to get rid of certain midot that he had. Right? We're talking about very deeply religious, spiritual people. And when we talk about Boaz and we read these stories, it's so easy to think of it in terms of like, oh, it's like General Hospital. You know, <laughs> it's like a soap opera, you know, like we're different... What's that? He notices her, yes, but again, he's noticing her because out of 
in the in the scenario that presented himself, something something did not something did not belong. So he was interested. He was curious. But I wouldn't say that he noticed her just because of her striking beauty. The beauty that he was relating to was the fact that she was a tznua. There was something unique about her, and that's where I believe it began and ended. Talk about a grandpa. When an old man sees a young lady, he's not, I hope, <laughs> that he's... All right, he's not dead. Listen, you know, like, again, like, whatever. Okay, fine. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna argue. This is, this is, I need more guys in this class. All right. Anyway, so, 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 uh, but I, yes, I don't believe. I, I do believe it's possible for there to be a scenario. You know, many years ago, I was on a panel. This is a little bit of a tangent, but it's related. I was on a panel for with a bunch of outreach rabbis on campus, and one of the questions that we were dealing with is, can a rabbi meet with women? Right? Is it appropriate? We're not talking about in seclusion. We're talking about in general, like you know, in a classroom in a public setting. Can a rabbi take out a girl to Starbucks to talk to her, to teach her, and so on and so forth? And there was a very massive divide and consensus about what protocol should be. So there's two approaches. There was one approach that one rabbi said absolutely not, because every interaction between a man and a woman is a sexual interaction. Right? That was what this person said, and I said, that's disgusting, and you should go see a therapist. <laughs> right? Because I don't think of every, and I don't see it like that at all. I, I, you know, can, can, isn't it possible for a man to have an interaction with a woman like, like a father would to a daughter? That's possible? That you're going to say that every time you meet with your daughter, she's in trouble? Like, what are you saying? Like, what does that even mean? Because I, I, don't, I don't think of those interactions like that at all. And I'm not there. So I think it depends on the person. Some people have a predisposition to thinking in a very naughty kind of way, and those people should not be meeting with women. But if a person does not have that predisposition, or you, you have a different kind of a, a different type of a, of a mental uh, framework, then that's not your issue. Of course, you follow the laws of, of, uh, of, uh, of Yichud, and you follow the laws of Tzni'ut, and all those things have to be there. Right? We're not talking about breaking those rules, but as long as those things are there, I don't have a problem with it. So we divide up the group into two different groups. So yes, there are some people that are, are what I would say, sick and broken, and those people should not be uh, meeting with, uh, with people of the opposite sex, and they may be very super talented, and they may be super amazing educators, but they should let them teach the boys. And maybe it's better for us to have a female educator working with the girls in those scenarios. But if you have a guy who's in a scenario where those are not his ta'avot, that's not his wavelength, then it's not a problem for him, as long as he's following halakha. For me, it's halakha first. As long as the Shulchan Aruch is there, and that is your guideline, I'm okay with it. Anything beyond that, you ask your LOR, your local Orthodox rabbi. Okay. The um, Tomar La Naomi. Okay, we're at number seven. Um, what's that? Yes, question. Did she know she was going to No. Random. Was just, that's a great question. She did not know. She was just, just going, because remember what the law was, Leket, the idea of Leket Pe'ah, that the back of the day there were these laws where you know you had a field and there was leftovers of the field you just let them there whatever fell fell and that was given to the poor people she was just looking she had no money she had nothing she was just trying to figure out a way of feeding herself and caring for her mother-in-law um, and so she just went to whatever field was there it makes sense that that, that uh, Naomi would go back to uh, the fields that were closest to her family right so it makes sense that they were in that area in that region and it makes sense that she would have ended up in that particular, in, that, in his particular yeah. field, in Boaz's field, because there, there, there's, there's... She does not know who he is. He introduces himself and so on and so forth. Again, you could go through this Pesukim. I'm trying to get to something a little bit different. It doesn't look like we're going to finish today. Um, but um, let's, try to, let's, try, let's just try to push a little bit more. We have a few more minutes. I want to try to... I want to try to uh, finish this. Okay, so fine. So, Vatomela Naomi Hamota, right? She says to her, "Yeah, you know what? I, I, you got to be clear about, you know, you know uh, what you want." And now there is this uh, special relation with Boaz, right? Whose girls you are close to. You'll be winnowing barley on the threshing floor tonight. So bathe, anoint yourself, dress up, and go down to the threshing floor. The Chachamim tell us this idea of bathing yourself, of going into the mikveh, is this part of this concept of uh, of, uh, of purifying yourself. Right, that, that for Jews, mikveh is not about cleanliness, right? It's about spiritual purity, okay? It's about part of the kavana, part of the meditation of going to the mikveh, by the way, is that when you're in the mikveh itself, you get into the fetal position, right? You open up your fingers, your toes, and part of what you're supposed to be thinking about when you're in the mikveh is leaving the worst, darkest parts of yourself in the water itself, right? You want to literally kill the lower parts of yourself. Why? Because if you stay in the water for too long, you ain't coming out. Right? The idea of putting yourself, submerging yourself in the water is about 
an act of death and coming out as an act of life. But not just to dip for the sake of dipping, because it's not about cleanliness. You're clean before you went in. You take a shower before you go in. Some people take a shower before and after, right? But the idea is a mental preparation, a spiritual preparation of leaving the lowest parts of your self in the water and coming out a newer, greater person. That's the meditation. So she says, do this. Go ahead. Go wash yourself clean. Leave the lowest parts of yourself in the water. Come out clean. Okay, involve yourself. She says, address up yourself, right? Become a tsnuah. Go down to the fresh water. Don't disclose yourself to the man who's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down in the place where he lies down, and go and cover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Okay, sounds like great advice from your mother-in-law. Okay, she's telling you, what's that? I can't hear, I'm sorry. Isn't that a sin? Isn't that a sin? Okay, why is that a sin? But remember that. Uh, but remember over here that uh, she is. There's a yibum here that would permit a uh, this act of connection, and they were aware of this. Now, what I skipped in this in the source over here is that a lot of the dialogue before this particular chapter is uh, is uh, um, Boaz going back and, and arguing with the Beitin as to whether or not a Moabite girl can convert, right? Because we know the halacha is now. We know the halacha is that a Moavia can convert, but a Moabite, a male, cannot. But that halakha was not established until this particular story. Okay? So there was this still uncertainty, but mitzan halakha, there was this still this sense of, well, he could be, technically maybe be with her. It wasn't sure. But once we clarify the halakha, at this point in the story, um, she's coming down there and trying to figure out what his stand is halakhically, because there, there was a massive debate. And after this story, this, the halacha is set that, they, that a Moaviyah can marry a Jewish man. Was she getting more latitude because she was a widow? Was she? Was she getting more latitude because she was a widow? More? Latitude, more leniency. Oh, more lax. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think so. This, was not, this, was, this wasn't just some, this wasn't a story of seduction in the classical sense, right? Remember that here there is a, a, a legal ruling that would permit her to marry him. And back then, remember, it wasn't like they had ceremonies like we have today. How did a man and a woman get married back then? Okay, you, you gave a high five and you went to your room and you consummated the marriage and that's it, mazel tov, you're married. Right, that's how you, that's how you got married back then. There was, and he had to go back and find out and no one wanted her. No one wanted her. He himself, didn't, he, saw, he saw and recognized that the situation unfolded itself in a very unique kind of way, okay? And there was something special about her. And he couldn't... There was. There were, there were other, there were other closer, there were closer blood relatives. Yes, there were closer blood, yes, there were closer blood relatives than him, yes. But they, they did, and they did. They did, and no one wanted to marry her, and he was the next, he had to be the next guy in line. So once he clarified his legal position with her, that's only when he acted. Now we know the story, how it ends. We know that, the, that they, are, they are together, and, they, and she conceives from that union, and he dies the next day. Right, he dies the next day. That he was almost, look, he was kept alive for this particular moment, and then he's out of the story, he's out of the picture. Right? What's that? Why does he die the next day? Um, I don't have a good answer as to why he died the next day. I could only say that, uh, well, <laughs> is this too much for you? All right, let, let's, let's, uh, all right, okay, ladies, I'm getting ADD. Um, let's, let's just try to, let's just try to stay focused, okay? In a nutshell, I want to, I want to end with the following, okay? You could go through this text uh, on your own. She goes through this process of preparing herself. We know how the story ends. She ends up going to lying down by his feet. We clear away the, the road, the, uh, any, uh, any kind of obstacles that may stand between them getting married and they end up getting married. The Yibum cycle is complete. Uh, Boaz ends up having a relationship with Naomi. 
uh, sorry, with Ruth and uh, Mechila with Ruth, and uh, they end up, she ends up having a child, right? Go to the end of it there. It says, uh, uh, look at number 11, Vikach, sorry, 13, Vikach, Boaz at Ruth, Vitilo Lishav, Yabo Alea, Vitena Hashem La, Herayon, Vitel at Ben. She ends up having a child. Tomorrow, Anna Shim, and let me, Baruch Hashem, Hashalo Yishbit Alach, Koal Ayom, Yikrash Shemo, Be Israel. What are we going to call him? Ayelo, Mashilo, Vinefesh. And we gave him a name. Right? We call the same the boy, the boy's name is Oved, and this is very clear. The text trying to make this this, this connection between this story and King David. Right? So um, we see this this concept of her waiting by the side of the bed and so on and so forth. Now, I'm just, uh, the, very, very quickly, this idea of, we spoke about virtue and passion, right, in, in uh, the last couple of classes. In order for malchut to work, it has to, you have to have both. So here you have people's passions being tested, right? But passion is a very curious thing. You know, a lot of my students say, Rabbi, should I go into not-for-profit? And I tell them, do not go into not-for-profit. They say, why? I said, because people in not-for-profit are very passionate about what they're doing. That's why they're there. But when you're working with passionate people, you make a lot of mistakes because of your passion. In business, there's no passion. It's very, very technical, right? Okay, I got to make money. Okay, we have HR. HR will take care of it. You don't have that in not-for-profit. Okay, but with a world of passion, passion often leads to all kinds of mistakes. Okay, so I tell them it's better off, you're better off you know, finding, you know, a cause you're going to donate your time to, but don't allow it to be the center of your, your focal work, okay? Unless you're someone who understands how to be disciplined enough and to control your passions. And I've seen this, I've seen organizations struggle because of passionate people in organizations, okay? But this passion has to be part of it. Our lives become dull when we're lacking passion. We need to be inspired by passion. King David has to come from a lineage of very, very passionate people. Boaz, passionate about figuring out how to help this young lady. Ruth, being passionate about bringing justice and bringing a name to her dead husband. Okay, Yehuda and Tamar. Tamar being passionate about justice. Yehuda taking responsibility, passion over there. Passion recombining with virtue is what we want. That connection, that power of these two things coming together is the prerequisite for David to bring forth Mashiach. And we'll see Bezrat Hashem next week how this same story and narrative takes place again with David and Bathsheba. Thank you so much for listening. Sorry for all the distractions. We'll see you all next week. Yeah.